I've decided to keep a journal. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Pauled Cast. You for me, the podcast about film, culture, politics, and Paul Schrader, where we watch every film written and or directed by American filmmaker Paul Schrader and explore how they speak to their moment. And this one, the show, is hosted by two guys. I'm one of the guys. My name is Jake Serwin. I'm one of the guys. My name is Ian Ryan. Jake, how's it going? Ian, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine, my friends. Here, it's raining. Chilling. Yeah. Okay. It's a beautiful afternoon. Is I'm it ready, raining down there? ready to talk about this film. I'll tell you this film. Okay. Oof contains maybe not just multitudes too many multitudes Multi that dudes. Can I, yeah it's <laughs> that as well <laughs> yep it does let's bring our guest in our guest today a film critic and writer recently revealed that Zack snyder called him brother <laughs> welcome to the show brandon streisner how you doing brandon? wow huge great uh i'm great thanks for having me on brother <laughs> well speaking of sort of like barely subsumed homoeroticism i feel like Zack snyder is in that that hallowed tradition he is. Yeah. I, I asked him a little bit about that. What, you know, not, not that specifically, but just like what makes him photograph the male form the way he does. And he made a funny joke in the interview. Um, he, what did he say? I forget the exact quote. It was something like, you know, I've, I've never been accused of exploiting the male form, but I guess I do do that uh, from time to time or something like that. And when I shared the interview, a bunch of people who don't get sarcasm uh, were saying like, you know, he's an idiot that if he doesn't see that, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, look, I think Zack Snyder's many things, but I think he's pretty self-aware. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. If, yeah, you, he's in a very direct conversation with like the Joel Schumacher yeah. Batman films with the, the nipples. I mean, yeah. 300 is, if we're talking <laughs> quasi fascist gay films, it's true. 300 and American it's... Gigolo double feature. He, He's interesting to me not to go off on too much of a tangent because I don't love most of his movies. I think he's like, mm -hmm. but I also think he's a chill guy who's not super thoughtful. So it's funny when people <laughs> like, people like, because 300 is super fascist. It's also yeah. based on Frank Miller, who's super fascist and yeah. everything. And I think Snyder leans into that stuff, but I don't think he's very thoughtful about it. And, I, and it's funny, like reading people attribute say that he's like, you know, this alt-right, you know, maniac. And it's like, I think he just likes cool shit and he's not very thoughtful about uh -huh. it. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he's particularly intellectual. He seems like he's more of a yeah. vibes-based An experiential thinker. artist. Yeah. yeah. As, uh, yeah, a strong yeah. opposition to a Paul Schrader type. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, we do have a lot of... Um, We're not... Shoe leather yeah. to get through. We've got we a couple of things to do. First of all... I have for you a new theme, a new, okay. a new theme, a new, uh, what am I saying? I have a new, I have for you a new segment. And, oh. It's so new, I have not actually put the sound effect into the soundboard. Give me one second, let's okay. see how this comes out. All right. This is a new segment called, Paul the News That's Fit to Clint. <laughs> okay. Um, I like it a lot so far. Yeah, thank you. This is just um, where we uh, we got to talk about some stuff that's come up with our guys mm -hmm. in the past past couple of. Well, we've never done this before, so basically everything that's happened to them since the beginning of the show, Oof, I guess, could take a while. But this is this is recent. So first of all, Clint made a rare public appearance. It was described as at a Jane Goodall 90th birthday thing. Did you guys see these photos? I saw that. Yeah, Brandon, are you are you aware of this? You see this? I I did. I saw the photograph so much so that uh, I don't know if this is part of what you're about to get to. I hope not. But I saw that there were conspiracy theories that it wasn't him and that it was a deep fake and that he's dead. <laughs> yeah, that's that's goofball shit to my yeah. to my mind. You know, thinking about it, he actually his beard, his beard has come in very fully. The man is still, I guess, high T even even at 90, <laughs> almost 94. Big time. He's got kind of like a Leonidas, speaking of, of Zack Snyder, got kind of a Leonidas. He looks like the, the bow of a ship or something. Mm. Just real powerful lines yeah. on this thing. Like a Duke Atreides yeah. type of a... Exactly. Mm. Thank you. I was trying to figure out how we were going to talk about Dune 2 on this episode. Found it Just early. keep the streak going. Early and Beautiful. often. Yep. Still haven't seen Dune oh, 2. It's fine. Yeah. Keep it. Keep, yeah. Keep yeah, it free up. yourself from the discourse. <laughs> that's okay. So that's the Clint part of it. And then we have to talk about this. So I, you know, we are, we failed the audience. 
but also the thing I'm about to say. Uh-huh. Uh, no, yep. we, we failed the audience in uh, in that on our Rolling Thunder episode. This is the not come across my desk. I don't know how I missed this, but apparently the the now canceled the movie critic uh, yes. Tarantino's yep. Ballyhooed tenth film. In my opinion, maybe stop talking about it and just make it or don't. Schrader had Paul Schrader's been the source of maybe the most concrete plot information about that film because <laughs> some people were suggesting that or were suspecting that it might be based on Pauline Kale and mm-hmm. then Tarantino said no it's not about Pauline Kale it's about a real male film critic and people were speculating that it was Paul Schrader Schrader in December I think apparently revealed that Tarantino had come to him to ask permission to shoot the ending of his original Rolling Thunder script. Whoa. Okay. Wow. Which is better than the ending of the John Flynn film. Mm-hmm. And Schrader said that's cool. There was also some rumor that he might be shooting some Taxi Driver, like remaking part of Taxi Driver. Apparently, Cinema Speculation, his his book, imagines Brian De Palma's version of Taxi Driver. I don't know. I haven't... Have you read the book, Brandon? Not yet, no. Um... <laughs> I have it. I, I barely. I, I hate saying this because I love Tarantino. I love how self indulgent he is. But I barely made it through the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood novel yeah. because I'm just like, yeah. It just it it's a lot. Like he's is, he's someone sure who I can is. listen to yeah. talk, but I'm also like the the mythologizing he's doing, like the weird alt history he's creating is like yeah. not that interesting. Well, to there me. was like, there was a some reveal or rumor that like Cliff Booth was going to appear in yeah, the, the movie, movie critic. critic. Yeah. I don't care for this. I don't no. like this. No, like you get the perfect amount of him in the movie. I think any more of that is, I don't know. Yeah. I, he's don't really know what's going on with Tarantino right now. He's kind of like I do not spiraling. either. Well, his wife is Israeli. And so things well, might be a little weird in his house is all I'm saying. Yeah. Also, <laughs> yeah. I don't, his house might be in Israel. I don't remember. It was, at uh, least. I don't know if it still is. Okay. But, yeah. So, you know, Tarantino, we encourage you to maybe take a trip out to the desert or something, walk around, don't talk to anybody for a while. It's yeah. kind of... It's a running, running theme with a lot of my favorite filmmakers. I'm, I mean, I don't know if... I'm sure you guys have seen me tweet incessantly about Michael Bay, and he's yes. he loves hanging out with the IDF, so uh, yeah, it's, he it's loves all a, disappointing. He yeah. loves a helicopter, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He might just think that their helicopters are cool. That's what I'm telling myself. Sure. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> in his defense, they probably have some of the newest helicopters, some of the, some of the <laughs> highest <laughs> tech. If you want the latest and greatest in merciless uh human life destruction technology you gotta you gotta <laughs> hang out with those idf guys they got all the yeah. new toys so that is paul the news that's fit to clint thank you so much uh for that now of course we have to do our signature segment of the two questions this is of course where we answer two questions in order to get to know each other and postpone talking about the film brandon were you able to come up with a question for the two questions I, I was. Um, I don't think it's a great one, but it's just I was kind of blown away perfectly. by. Well, uh, I was kind of blown away by how young Bill Duke was here. I don't think I've ever seen oh, yeah. him look that young. Yeah. And so I guess my question is, what's your favorite performance of his? Because he's Ooh, pretty incredible in this. Great question. Yeah. I believe this is Bill Duke's second I feature think that's film. Right. Yeah. After it's wild. Car he's, wash. He's unbelievable in this. Blue collar star Richard Pryor, and True. written wow. by Joel Schumacher, who I just talked about. His moments uh, ago, penchant for nipples, mm. yeah, um, <laughs> male nipples. I think my favorite Bill Duke performance has got to be Predator. It's hard yeah. to top Predator. Yeah, I'm thinking off the top. Of my- I did just watch X Men Three. I, in which he- I would <laughs> thought you might bring this up. He is in there is as he- Oliver Trask. Yeah, yeah. Right. he he. Uh, wow, they man, way to whitewash him a few movies later and mm-hmm. make well, him a lot and also shorter. And- just well, he doesn't. It, it's really it's like a waste of the character <laughs> and a waste of Bill Duke. He's he's just a guy at a table who says like uh, launch the strike or whatever. He's got nothing interesting to do. Why would you spend? the incredible <laughs> talent of of bill duke on that that role maybe, maybe uh brett ratner wanted him on set because he's like i you know you're a great filmmaker i want to learn from you <laughs> you know you <Yeah. laughs> get some tips from him on how to direct a movie is ratner in <laughs> israel now because we i know brian singer is has <laughs> man has boy has moved over there it, I, I'm not sure. I, I do love how most of the X-Men movies are directed by some of the worst people to ever live. <laughs> yeah. like, yep. Matthew Vaughn quickly revealing his own 
pretty weird shit that he's got going on. Yeah, yeah. He, I'm sure if you look under that hood, there's nothing good there, too. He, <laughs> he's like the cleanest out of all of them, and he's not doing too well. And no. I don't even remember. I can't remember who directed Dark Phoenix. I think it was, it was the writer. Kinberg, yeah, who seems oh, to yeah. have been the... Simon Kinberg seems to have been the, like, secretly keeping the car <laughs> on the road for yeah. the last couple singer films. So Kinberg, I imagine, is maybe just like an exhausted sad broken man but yeah i'm sure he sure there's a lot of uh parties that uh he didn't want to know about mm-hmm. while he was, yeah. when he's directing yeah. the singer sorry roland movies. i can't Dick make Lanning. it again uh-huh. tonight. a lot yeah. of yeah. invitations <laughs> yep yeah yep <laughs> busy church schedule uh-huh. allegedly 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 <laughs> yeah right 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 yeah what's so so What's the what's your favorite, Brandon? Did you say? The, I think I agreed with you that it is Predator. Like, Predator. there's a lot I could choose from, but I mean, he's just he's so locked in in Predator. Mm. It's he's like, so good. The, the The shaving scene is like Ugh. one of which the best. one? Like, <laughs> it, good point. Oh, true. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the uh, the second one. But um. Mm. But man, he he almost plays his character in that movie like a Schrader character. He's yeah. like the most. Yeah. Co- yeah. 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 It's. That, that that's probably one of the 10 best movies ever made i think but, it's so um, good and he's not yeah. in deep cover right but deep cover is no, I was, no, i was gonna say incredible. if we can cheat i'm gonna say deep cover because I his mean, that's fine, there. Yeah, yeah i think that's fine because that yeah. movie is a masterpiece uh yeah. ian what about you yeah well besides that i mean obviously somehow there's a there's a Lawrence fishburne uh film that's totally underseen that it seems impossible to me jeff Bo- a, a Lawrence fishburne and jeff goldblum film that's totally underseen yeah. which seems yeah, insane yeah, yeah. But yeah, Predator, I think he's in the limey as like a cop or he something, is, yeah. uh, which I think, yeah. you know, I like the limey. He's great. He's great in Mandy too. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He has that yep. little moment with Nick Cage. Yeah. I don't, I barely remember that film. I was kind of getting mad. I don't, we'll have to, <laughs> if, uh, you if seeing we wanted to, I was, I was seeing yeah. a lot of red and, I, um, uh, I thought this Andrew w- Riseboro woman, she's, uh, she's seeming too normal. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I I saw that uh, after eating mushrooms and it oh, really there you go. Yeah. So it kind of fucked me up. <laughs> but uh, it, it's weird seeing him this uh, like svelte in he a is, movie. Yeah, he's looking yeah. trim. Like he, not 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 that he's like a big guy or anything. Well, but, but like just, in Predator, they're all like beefy. muscle men. Muscle, yeah. yeah, yeah. And he yeah. seems he just he retains that kind of imposing presence. Uh, but yeah. yeah, he's like a little he's trimmer here. It's still six four and a half. Man, wow. Got a half inch on on Clint. Although at this point wow. he's got well, they're he's eighty one, so they're probably both stooping. Sure. Now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the question, Ian. Oh, do you have do you question. have one for us? I do, and I'm I I feel rewarded for my question even before I've asked it because I want to ask about your home decoration ethos. What is your mm. goal in in home decor? And I I feel rewarded Great. because behind Brandon is a rich tapestry of home decor choices. <laughs> so yeah, what. I don't it, not even necessarily what you do but why why do you do it? Honestly, it's just shit I like for the most part. Mm. Like I I try not to make it look like I I do try to have like a I don't know what the word is, like kind of set things to where they're not just like on top of one another. Although the heroic trio poster, I literally had no space for it, so it is kind of just thrown in there at the bottom, but uh Looks great. But I don't know, I just have like stuff I like everywhere. Mm. Um mm. like pictures of like LA, which is one of my favorite places. Um I don't know. I, I like to just have like, I, I like it to feel like when you walk into my house, it's like, this guy loves movies. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, I'm yeah. getting that impression. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I also, I also try to have like some of my own accomplishments, like just like some stuff I've written, I have framed mm, in certain cool. places. Nice. Like, so yeah, just kind of like a whole movie theme. Uh, my, my girlfriend who, you know, we just started dating a few months ago when she was here recently, she was walking around and she was like, I feel like this is like, a museum and i'm like yeah i kind of wanted to go for that but like a little homier not not like cold and i think think i got that so, yeah i was gonna say it doesn't yeah. have the the fully curated minimalism to me it sounds like it's yeah it, it's exposing some of who you are when you walk in i think that's right. nice yeah well well thank you <laughs> ian and i of course lived together for we did. probably what like a year or two yeah somewhere in there yeah yep. And For a minute, I, I misunderstood that as live together, and I was like, "Man, I, I'm like, man, are you guys pretending to? Uh, you know, you're in separate <laughs> yeah. rooms Elaborate. right now." Like, yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. And we never put anything on the walls in that no. entire time. To be yep. fair to us, we were like 21, 22. Sure. Didn't, you know. Now I have some stuff stacked against the wall over there 
that hasn't been put up since I moved in to this apartment like a year ago. So I am I'm I'm Julian K ing <laughs> a little bit. Mm, very minimally. I mean I've been to your apartment, yeah. my man. That seems We get some stuff on the wall. Yeah. Um my decoration style is more stuff on the floor uh-huh. than the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly at this point cat litter, dried cat food, <laughs> cat toys. Uh-huh. Things like that. But I yeah, I, I like a thing on the wall, but also I don't want to have too many things on the wall. Plus, I'm bad at hanging stuff on the wall. I, I gotta ask you, Brandon, are you a command strip guy? Are no, you, uh, these, these are, are nails. What do we no, got? No, these are all nails. So I'm uh, I'm looking to move here in a few months, so mm. that I'm not gonna. I, I I do have a lot of stuff hanging, but it's not like it is spread out enough. But there is a lot, and so that's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, going over that with whatever that's called i can't remember the name right the, now like but putty uh, spackle yeah something like yeah, that. spackle that's right yeah. yeah but um yeah i i'm a nail guy old school yeah i yeah i i never have the right size of nail it's always i always can only find a very small or very large nail <laughs> and i don't put <laughs> stuff up often enough to go like get the right nails you know it's a whole thing with me ian your decoration style is what What's going oh, on? I thought you were gonna uh, make this <laughs> make some type of assessment. No, uh, I can't. I can't. I don't have enough information, really. Well, I feel like I think that's part of the the consequence of the style itself, uh, kind of yeah. inherent to the lack of anything happening. Yeah, I admire very much. Uh, I guess I could say your, but I I really mean your lovely podcast girlfriend, yeah, and yeah, by yeah. extension, your design style, because basically. She I directs got, and I execute. Is really but how, how your goes. your presence is in there. I mean, you got yeah, at least in the old place. You had sorcerer posters. You had Japanese yep. film posters for all sorts right. of different stuff. The the, the J posters are pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, it's a very odd experience of leaving your apartment and coming back to have people living there and having decorated it pretty much as you would have liked to have seen it be decorated, but you don't yeah. live there anymore. So Could put up a bunch of pictures of your mom and dad yeah. like on their, <laughs> on their I mean, anniversary you and stuff. Quite literally do have a picture of my mom and dad on your refrigerator. You yeah. Used to, well, so. Ian, uh, we get the, the Ryan family Christmas card every year. We put it on the fridge, which yeah. is very sweet. And if you ever stop doing it, I will kill myself in front of you. <laughs> parody, parody. That's the joke. Great. Yeah. I, I, to me, the two styles that seem to predominate are either purely aesthetic, like creating some type of effect for people who visit right. your home or the sharing some part of yourself. I think both of them have compelling uh, arguments. I have not achieved either of them. I have a visual closed offness that I think reflects what's going on with me emotionally yeah. sometimes. Well, so. I, you agree with Paul Schrader when he says... This is from Trader on Trader. My idea of a well-decorated room is four white walls with a little cross over a cot. Yeah, except I think a cross is a little bit indulgent. You know? The man Paul, longs Paul, Paul for... Paul Schrader said that? Are you sure that was him who <laughs> said that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Is yeah. there anything to suggest that that might be the case? Yeah. <laughs> yep. What a guy. Mm-hmm. What a guy. I was going to... Oh, yeah. I was going to say... Uh... Something you said, Ian, kind of sounded like a person's name. I was going to say they were going to be our guest next week, but it's cool. gone from my head. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> listener, imagine. Listener, imagine will be the guest on our show next okay. week. Cool. Okay. Now, of course, it is time for the episode on American Gigolo. <laughs> You're close to sound alike so far, I think. Thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know this about you. Kind of. I a, really hate that guy. Billy. Which, oh shoot. Billy Joel. Billy yeah. Joel Armstrong. Yeah. You know, was, uh, he had <laughs> yeah. one of those um, signature guitars. You know how like a famous yeah, guitar yeah, yeah. player, like yeah. Fender, his, put out a. His mm-hmm. was a junior size guitar. That's not a joke. <laughs> He's like a little guy, and so mm-hmm. he said, "My signature guitar is going to be for little guys." Well, that's I don't like know. Uh, Prince's guitar. I've um. I, I held his guitar oh, years ago and the Smithsonian, uh, it's a long story, but I knew someone who worked there and oh, I did okay. like a I tour. Gonna, I thought you were going to say there's some alarms going off, but you got your <laughs> yeah. hands on it for just a long second. Sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm getting arranged like next week. But... I, I did like a tour of like the stuff that they weren't housing. So mm. I held somebody's Oscar. I don't remember whose it was. And um, I held Spacey. his guitar and his guitar was tiny. Like wow. Because he, oh, he's also okay. a little man. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but but he's he was talented. little in like a cool yeah. way. It's true, yeah. Billy, yeah. Billy Joe Armstrong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's the episode on American Gigolo. We're talking about American Gigolo. This is a film by Paul Schrader. Mm-hmm. Have Two times you ever over. heard of him? Yep. Yeah. Written and directed. Now we we didn't tell the story on our hardcore episode. I will tell it now. Oh, no, this is the time that you mean hardcore. 
His last film. His Yes. This film comes out February 1st, 1980. It's almost a, exactly a year after Hardcore, like 51 weeks after Hardcore comes out. So he says, and this is from Schrader on Schrader. One night we were shooting in San Francisco in the Tenderloin area. It was about midnight. We were planning to wrap that part of the shoot, fly to San Diego the next day and start work again on Monday. All George, this is George C. Scott, all George had to do in the scene was enter a bar and look around. And I knew I could light that section very quickly, whereas the other sh- sections would take an hour or two. Now, normally I would have shot him first, but I checked with the AD and said, can we let George sit in his trailer for two or three hours? And everyone said, sure, he's a professional. But then when the time came for his scene, I started sending emissaries to his trailer and he just wouldn't come out. So finally, I went to see him myself and he was sitting at the back of his trailer with an empty bottle of vodka in front of him and he was drunk and he was pissed off. I walked in and said, hi, George. And he said, this movie's a piece of shit. So I started to reason with him, but he said, this is shit. You're a terrific writer, but you're a terrible director. You should not be directing. So I said, yes, George, I see you're right. I've made a terrible mistake, but now I have to finish the job. So will you come and help me? He says, I'll come on one condition. What is it, George? You have to promise me you'll never direct again. (laughs) So I got down on my knees and promised, and he got up and did his one minute shot. And then we finished the main part of the shoot. Then there was a hiatus and we went back to Michigan to shoot a spring scene just for a couple of days. We're sitting in the bar of the hotel. And George is at the bar, and I'm at a table, and all of a sudden, I hear this booming voice, Schrader! (laughs) I walk over, he's got variety in his hands, and there's an announcement that I'm going to do American Gigolo with John Travolta. He said, Schrader, you promised me you would never direct again. I said, George, what can I say? I lied. Uh, (laughs) What a stinker, this Paul Schrader. Now, here we are. American Mm. Gigolo. Uh, Of course, the film was, I believe it was initially set up with gear... And Julie Christie was interested in playing the the Michelle part. And then Gear is replaced with Travolta, who's obviously a bigger star. Julie Christie doesn't want to do it with Travolta. By the time Gear comes back on, she's otherwise engaged. So mm. no Julie Christie. Studio wanted Jessica Lang, who found the script to be too dark. Don't know what she could have meant by that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, what is this was so this was both this was your first time seeing this, Brandon. Is that right? It was, yeah. It was my first time because it's weird. I, I love Paul Schrader, love everything I've seen, but this is definitely the biggest blind spot. But there's a ton of blind spots I have. Like I just, I was looking at his filmography here, and I'm just like, man, there's stuff all over it where you're just like, like touch mm. and like it's like, man, like I there's so much that I missed because he's he's done a lot and not all of it good. And I think that, that's sort of related to today. I think a little bit. This is good, but yeah. Not all of it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I I, yep. I, yeah. I think that's. Exactly right. And all, always fascinating, I would say. Yeah. So far, anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, kind of like, I think Roger Ebert said that about Werner Herzog. Like, he's never made an uninteresting film. But we'll put that to the test because, you know, we haven't gotten to... Well, I saw Light of Day many years ago. Mm. So, I'm expecting that that one might not <laughs> okay. be uh, that, that interesting. Is that the one that's also called Dying of the Light? Dying of the Light is, is also called Am I Dark. forgetting one? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. right, right. Man, the Light he... of Day was originally called Born oh, in the, the USA. The yeah, one Michael like, J. Fox. Yeah, movie. yeah, it was gonna be Springsteen. Yeah. It's a whole thing. We're gonna. I'm excited to to get into that. But Man, uh, he has some he has some stuff in here that's just like you you, you never would have known he directed it. It's so funny. Yeah, it's really. I mean, I'm I'm pumped. Uh, yeah. as, you know, compared to to our our last subject, Schrader, Schrader seems always to be kind of like scrounging together a movie. Yeah. Despite people trying not to let him. <laughs> I'm excited for you guys to uh potentially be the uh the Adam Resurrected Reclamation project. Oh, well, it, I'm yeah, excited. A... I'm excited for Adam Resurrected. Um <laughs> I I can't wait. We we don't really we haven't really talked about his Facebook that much. <laughs> not enough, certainly. Yeah, not enough. By the way, as of this recording, he has not said anything yet about the new Taylor Swift album. I know he's a big Taylor Swift guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we're not if, if he post something crazy before this episode comes out it's not our fault that we don't talk we didn't talk about it. i've been checking like well i'm looking for, forward to her winning best original song for oh canada that <laughs> <laughs> i would Me too. i would listen yeah. to it and yeah. i would i would campaign but he posted on facebook not that long ago there's uh, something about how netflix needs to be a repository for documentaries about the final solution <laughs> Uh, so okay, man. Anyway, connects connects to Adam Resurrected, I think. Yep. Uh, this is the episode on American Jiglo. Uh, Ian, you've seen this film before? You know, this is we haven't really talked about the the whole gamut of 
experiences with a film you can have. I'd seen about 30 minutes of this film two times in college because it was the Holy type of... Holy shit, did you fall asleep too? No, this was just the type okay. of thing that you might go to somebody's house who's kind of like yeah. arty but also hip and they have it on and you miss the first mm-hmm. 10 minutes mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. it gets turned off before you get to the last half. So this was my first full experience and I'll be honest, I was excited because on paper, man, what a what a movie. Richard Gere, semi-positive view of sex work, extremely 80s sheen somehow before there's yeah. 80s and also drawing from like, you know, some of the best stuff there is. Your your Brisson, your Crime and Punishment, your Stendhal, uh, The Trial. How can you go wrong? The Conformist, you know, it's just like this endless list yep. of sources yeah. that seem like they're going to make this incredible picture and I think they sometimes get close, is what I will say. Probably, yeah. There are there are really fascinating sequences, and yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot that works about this. And honestly, shocking how well it did. Like it made ten times its budget. It made it would cost five million dollars. It made fifty. Yeah. In 1980, money. Call me comes from this movie. I yeah. don't think I realized that the Blondie song "Call Call Me" comes from this movie. Brandon, you're. I hope it's. I hope it's not out of turn to say that you are. I think prone to tweeting that. Something you've just watched is the greatest movie you've ever seen. This is something you you like to do. I do that with with Michael Bay a lot. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, that's uh-huh. true. That's correct. Yeah, it's funny. I think people misread my excitement as the greatest thing I've ever seen. Uh-huh. Like, okay, it, like I really dug the first Omen, and and I I was listening to another podcast I like, and they were talking about. I don't know where I, I felt like a, a drive-by happened where they were like, oh, yeah, I saw uh, one of our buddies, Brandon, said that this is like the best movie of the year. And then the other three were like, it's fine. And I'm just like, where did I say that? Like, kind of straight, <laughs> yeah. huh? Well, you know, I, I think it's it's refreshing and it's it's rare to, to find somebody uh, willing to express enthusiasm that might, you know, might wane later. I feel like we're all, so many of us are trying to head off being called like dweebs at the you know later i definitely do that for michael bay i do have i do have to say i um i i I felt myself become less negative and there's a reason for that and it's because i've sold out but um (laughs) i uh tell me more do you have any is there someone i can talk to about selling out as well (laughs) well yeah it's it i've sold i've sold out for very little money but um, Mm, oh okay uh, it, it no, it's, it it feels like that because I used to be much more honest about how I I thought about things, and now if I don't like something, I I don't say it a lot because my opportunities have grown over the last two years. Yeah, I, I all this is to say that you you posted a, the intro to this film on on Twitter and said something about your longest yeah boy ever. I loved the intro. Totally. The I intro agree. Really, yeah. yeah, yeah. The intro really I, sets you up to be watching the greatest film of your life. Yep, and. It, the movie is a frustrating experience because that first yeah. however many minutes feels like, well, one, you understand why this made so much money because this right. definitely feels like his most audience friendly movie for sure. But the first 40 ish minutes feel like he's kind of doing like a Michael Mann thing. It's like all vibes. And it I is, saw yeah. someone describe Schrader as an anti vibes filmmaker. And I feel like that's what the back half of this is. And I feel like he is still working out how to marry those two kind of things. And yeah, it, yeah, it, I, I liked the movie a lot. I, I loved a good bit of it, but I felt I, there is a drop off for sure. It's misshapen. No, mi- mi- Mishima is how you pronounce that. <laughs> oh, and that's oh, the right, next right. film. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a couple from now. Well, it's weird. You brought up hardcore and I think if I'm pushed, hardcore might be my favorite of his movies, even though that's similarly misshapen, but I think wow. in a better, in a more ex- exciting way. And part of that is George C. Scott's performance. But uh, I don't know. This one really feels like him figuring some shit out. and. I don't know. I liked it a lot. I wish wish I could have I had one of my patented uh, best movie ever <laughs> tweets for this one. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's I, I wonder Ian, maybe this is something this is a subject for further study, but I wonder if if the transcendental style that Schrader is so famous for identifying is that in opposition to vibes? Is it a different kind of vibe? He does actually call out man he does uh, doesn't, yeah. he doesn't call him out he he shouts him, shouts out. him mm-hmm. out yes there you go in in trader on trader and talks about the fact that they're both learning or or sitting at the feet of scarfiotti yes they're both learning from like the high style which uh, as he calls it of of the italian filmmakers he says it's influenced a lot of people scorsese coppola to create films of high style and now it's finally reached its conclusion in things like miami vice you can trace miami vice right back right the way back to the conformist 
because Michael Mann, who's a friend of mine, was very impressed by the work Scarfiati did on both Gigolo and Scarface, and that's what he tried to emulate. So, yeah, and I, I think we've discussed previously the fact that transcendental style, again, for those who haven't read the text, is about challenging the traditional like montage action based relationship with film where you're trying to communicate things as they occur and the feeling of those things sort of like a, in the most expressive way possible cutting between things to create more explicit relationships etc cetera, etc cetera. and in contrast to that is the transcendental style which i think he he says like works in time and is focused on forcing you to over the course of seconds or minutes or in the case of a, a Bellatar, like hours or something, engage mm-hmm. and have your relationship with an image or an idea evolve like in real time based on being forced to sit with that. So I don't know if those are totally in opposition. Uh, I mean, I think sometimes when people say vibes, they do want energy. They want flow, which is, again, kind of what he's pushing back against. But yeah, I don't know if it's totally true that you can't have those things because I think the conformist one of the films that he's again saying is like a huge influence on this and he brings in the same art director set designer is kind of both those things i think the, the conformist is extremely a vibe and also is achieving some of this sort of like alienation and then rebirth of a new relationship with a single image that you're forced to to confront for an extended period of time or something like that and i think what's confusing about american gigolo in so many ways i totally agree with brandon hardcore is a few different films that meet in a productive way. American Gigolo to me feels like a few different films that each of each of which could have been more interesting and they're sort of like in theory should work together but are at odds with each other in the film itself. And I think, you know, like he tries to arrive at a Rissant type ending that I'm sure we'll we'll talk about, but yes. even that feels like has he earned it? Does it match with the film he was making up until that point? And even the first few minutes which is like this type of montage of Malibu Highway, Blondie. We get like little hints of his job, but he's so charming and he's just coming out and shaking his Looking head. Cool, uh, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's a different, it's a different picture, basically. I'm yeah. not sure if this is a controversial thing to say because I think he's striking in the movie, but I don't think Richard Gere is able to meet what this movie. I agree is entirely. Of him. Yeah. Yeah. It's, because I do feel you, I feel like as the movie goes along, the sound starts to get kind of sucked out of the movie to uh-huh. the point where it like, does it, very yeah, dramatically. And, yeah. Yeah. And by the time he like, I, you, you guys spoil on here, right? We do. Yep. Yes, okay. we do. Um, I, I like, like uh, the, the mood you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, my, yeah. My mood specifically. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but um, when, when he's sitting in the jail cell, it's like, there's no sound. You just hear like the wind basically like, right. and it's like a very interesting thing. And I think Schrader's trying to, convey some sort of an arc for Julian, but I don't feel like Gear is able to meet that at all. It's, he, it's a frustrating he, yeah. performance. Yeah. He's at a profound remove. I, I, I think this is an interesting sh- sort of Schraderian text in that you have so many of the kind of things that people have identified in his, in his work. The man in a room, as he calls it, the, the sort of isolated protagonist with a very strict set of maybe amoral values, a very, you know, a strict personal code, but you don't, he doesn't journal and he doesn't narrate and we don't, we get very little access to his interiority at all to the extent that he has any. And I, obviously the film is, is about surfaces and this, this, Mm -hmm. the term comes up basically anyone's, anyone's writing on this film, they're going to talk about how it's about surfaces. But I think gear, I think you're right that gear has beautiful surfaces, but he doesn't have the kind of roiling depth that's obvious on like a De Niro. And of course, you know, we get we get him his his voiceover in, in Taxi Driver as well, for example. But it's it's just hard to read him. And when the film takes the the direction that it does, where he is suddenly accused of murder and like there are times when I wasn't sure if we were supposed to maybe wonder if he actually did it. And then, you know, when, when we get the ending, the, the, the sort of uh, pickpocket ending, it does feel like it comes kind of out of nowhere and not as a not as a shocking break from how he's been, but just sort of a huh kind of like what? what? Totally. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to contend that for me, I actually think he was given an impossible task because I don't disagree with you guys. It feels like right, I don't know how much of it's in the script. You know, yeah, because 
I guess what I feel like is that if you are trying to make somebody who is surfaces, like you're saying, or, or is lost in surfaces, like these characters in, in Pickpocket or Crime and Punishment, people who create this like shell or projection that they're supposedly trying to match this like hard exterior. And then in Pickpocket, at the end, it's broken. And it's also kind of a surprise. Pickpocket ends with this sort of like revelation about maybe the transcendent power of love or like human grace mm. to sort of like break through this. And it's also not been set up in the film necessarily. There's like little hints at it. But that's, that to me makes me feel like that's not even necessarily the problem. The problem is that in the film, sometimes we feel like it is being set up and then sometimes it's not. Sometimes the surface is him, is the surface him being shallow and superficial and, and consumerist and image-based or is the surface this idea of him as like a guy who wants to help old people have orgasms, right? Which is, <laughs> right. it's hard to even say like, what is the projection? Yeah. So do you want to do a 30 second summary here? I would love to do a 30 second summary right. here. So I should say first, we, I mentioned on our hardcore episode, we're in the sort of Schrader's brief Jake period where mm. the protagonists of this, or of hardcore and of uh, Raging Bull, both named Jake. And this is kind of, I mean, his name is Jewel Ian. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> sort yeah. of an Ian style of uh, it's, a, it's a type of an ian yeah. yep and you you also have gotten in trouble uh because of your fondness for standing nude next to an open window <laughs> been a problem for you. Yeah. <laughs> sorry 30 second summary uh richard gear is julian k who is a like a very high class male escort to older women who has a very like precise way that he lives his life he wears these beautiful armani suits he drives a mercedes he lives in a uh, fancy apartment in Westwood that seems to have room service somehow. <laughs> um, he only does the kind of jobs that he wants to. Uh, he, he's, and he's like a, crucially a, a social aspirant. He's, a, he's yeah. trying to move up and he's, he's sort of put on the surfaces of a, a class to which he does not belong. And he does a favor for an old pimp played by Bill Duke to go and do a job out in Palm Springs, which turns it, it's a sort of a S and M type thing where a husband wants to watch Julian uh, have rough sex with his wife. And then after this, or at some point in this, he meets a woman played by a woman named Michelle played by Lauren Hutton, who is the uh, unsatisfied wife of a Senator. They have like a, seem to have an actual romantic connection. He is accused of the, it turns out the woman he, he had the, did the rough trick with in, Palm Springs has been murdered. He is the primary suspect. He's trying to sort of clear his name, but he is unable to because his alibi is a fancy lady who doesn't want to admit that she was with him. Mm -hmm. His The services crumble. He is uh, eventually imprisoned for this murder until Michelle sacrifices her own appearance of domestic bliss in order to give him an alibi. And they embrace with a they they uh, attempt to embrace with a glass pane between them a la pickpocket yeah and at some point bill duke is uh thrown over a balcony true yep call me the end um <laughs> so that's the film american jiggle thank you so much brandon for coming <laughs> on the show yeah <laughs> thank you uh you can find me at uh... <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's there's a lot going on here and i wish that there was more. I will say Schrader has uh, explained his writing process. There's a there's a BAFTA lecture, I think, that has been released as a podcast where he goes into this in, in uh, detail. But his writing process, at least at this time, is basically thinking of a, a personal problem or something, an unresolved thing in his life that he wants to write about, and then a metaphor through which to address that problem. Don't address it directly. Uh, he, he says that when he, he tries to address things directly, it, he doesn't like the way it turns out, specifically hardcore and light of day. He, he identifies as sort of failed films of his, in his mind, because they're a little too direct. On the note. And, yeah. and he also talks about finding an occupation specifically yes. that allows him to, to explore this, this metaphor, this, this personal yes. problem of his. And the theme he says the theme is the inability to express love this is mm -hmm. something he wanted to address and the metaphor was a gigolo now you guys know where the word gigolo comes from i learned this i 
did learn this also, and I was surprised to hear this. I I thought it was a, a genuine Italian word or something. I but did no. too. Ian, where 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 does it come from? Well, it's like a bastardization of uh, an existing name. Well, I learned it was from a French term. Yeah, but it's like a term for it's a what is it? Gigolette. Gigolette. Yeah, gigolette, which is from. Basically, like women, you can pay to as to be your dance partner, and also maybe have sex with you. Yes, but. which is sometimes referred to as a taxi dancer, which is oh, interesting. Wow. Okay. Uh, to think about some other trade. Uh-huh. This is uh, this is what Charity's job is in the film Sweet Charity. Uh, she's a taxi dancer. But basically, Americans imagine they made up an Italian masculine right. form to match this. The so there's I guess, there, French maybe. There is no gigolo. Who's not American, sort of? If yeah, you think about it, that's true. Mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I watched except Deuce Bigelow. I he was, was a European. Say, I watched Deuce Bigelow. <laughs> it is shocking how much Deuce Bigelow, a 1999 film, is a direct parody of this movie <laughs> from 1980. I was also trying to think. Imagine you were parodying a film from 2005 today. It would be like from a different yeah. century. Peter Jackson's King Kong. Uh-huh. Yeah. I would call it. Yeah. It, you know, it's that's the kind of movie that people like young people will say that's old. I don't want to yeah. watch that. It's old. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yeah. The 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 Americanness of it is is fascinating as well, because Schrader talks about how he says, I hit on this theme and I realized that the gigolo, the character of the gigolo was en- essentially a character of surfaces. Therefore, the movie had to be about surfaces and you had to create a new kind of Los Angeles to reflect this new kind of protagonist. Well, what better to do this than to bring in outsiders for whom there is no old Los Angeles? So I went to what I called my new Axis powers from Munich and Milan. And I got the visual style from Armani and Scarfiotti and the music from Giorgio Moroder from Germany. The imposition of these very European sensibilities started to create the new ki- the kind of new L.A. I wanted. I pretty much sat at Nando Scarfiotti's knee in the same way I had sat at Charles Eames's knee years before and let him teach me about visual thinking. Paul Schrader not beating the quasi-fascist allegations. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and this is kind of ahistorical because, you know, there was famously a big German emigre population in Los Angeles. Your, your Brechts and your... Uh, yeah, your, your, your Frankfurt um, school. Yeah. Frankfurt school guys. But I do think, yeah, he, he brings in... Moroder is an Italian guy, but he was working in Munich, like the Munich dance music scene. Well, he's one of those, he's, you know, he's the perfect axis. He was born in like South Tyrol or whatever. Uh, Jesus. You know, uh, yeah. like right on the edge of Italy and Germany. <laughs> Where they have those hats you like so much. That's right. Yeah. I'm wearing one now. <laughs> yes. And as we'll learn also in the film, there is this, there is, you know, the cu- the cutting edge sort of masculine ideal of Europe, of Italy specifically, mm. reads in an American context as much more queer coded than it would in, in Europe Italy, itself, perhaps, you know, yeah. yep. this Italian, I, I guess, I guess so much of what I think of as like LA style of the eighties is from this movie, like is started by this movie. Yeah, he brings, he makes Armani, which yep. is crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Armani uh, apparently initially came on to make suits for, like they started making the suits for Travolta, who is like five inches taller than Richard Gere and they had mm. to uh <laughs> they had to just start from scratch. But yeah, I'm I don't know, where should we start? Should we start with the costumes? Where where are you guys Well yeah, let's start with this new eighties LA. I think Brandon is yeah. especially as a as a fan of the city and probably as somebody who's aware as we all are of the eighties as like a stereotyped cultural moment. Uh what do you think about this debut? Well, the the biggest thing I had on my mind with the 80s-ness of it all is a lot of it feels a little too soon because you do feel like there's a satire trying... Like, we're right on the precipice of, like, yuppie culture. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and it feels like he's trying to satirize it a little bit and, sh- and show the dark side of it. You know, like, Bill Duke has that whole line about, you know, these women are going to turn on you and that's exactly what happens. But I feel like what what it was making me think of a lot, and I didn't realize it, at the time, but it's kind of like connecting now, especially because one of you said earlier that you weren't sure if the film wanted you to believe that he might have done done this. And I think there is a coldness to him. There's like nothing behind his eyes. And I think, you know, I, I hate the whole expression of like, I, I hate saying, oh, you know, this movie did this better. But I think a movie that does all of this better for the most part is American Psycho. Mm, it feels right very similar to this and this movie feels almost too soon to try to be making the points it's making which isn't a necessarily a bad thing he did see what was coming but 
again, I don't think I, I find that interesting. I find it. I don't know. I saw someone. Someone responded to me on Twitter when I tweeted out my Yeah Boy uh, <laughs> intro tweet and said, you know, this is a movie where the 70s became the 80s. And I think that that's extremely on point. And I yeah. think you, you can see the whole yuppie movement happening in this movie, but it's hard to kind of decipher where it's heading or what to even make fun of, really, because it's so unformed. I agree with you, Brandon. I mean, the fact that it's parroting, uh, I mean, I think the word yuppie was used in an article, at least it's traced back to this exact same year. So like, like you're saying, oh, it's wow. just the, yeah. the concept is barely being formed and Reagan has not become president yet. All these things we associate with this uh, shift in, in government policy towards neoliberalism and personal policy towards unashamed consumerism. Uh, right. Not that there wasn't yeah. consumerism before, but sort of like proud, conspicuous consumption. That didn't hadn't quite been formed and like you're saying i was tr i was wrestling with how much I, we can compare this to other films and you know is that unfair but i think the reason that that at least i have that instinct is because what this film seems to be trying to say and i know that's weird to talk about like intention in that way but reading sort of like with the text is one message and then mm -hmm. reading what is mm -hmm. actually on the screen feels like a very different yeah. message so i feel like the reason i want to talk about other things is those things seem to follow through better with what like the same ideas that I think Schrader is aiming at here. So it's hard not to say like what's missing in this film or what doesn't quite work. Because again, I think he is trying to make a film as far as I can tell. I mean, I think you guys are correct. He even says in the in Schrader on Schrader that he wanted it to be ambiguous whether or not this guy had maybe done it. But the films that he's drawing from like Pickpocket we know the guy is stealing. That's not a question. Yeah, right? we Crime see and punishment, him do it the whole time. Yeah, there's a huge part where he murders the lady. There's no question about like these people who are <laughs> right, right. Uh, sort of like lost in their own attempt at embracing some type of Ubermensch ideology. And in this film, we don't know if he did it. We don't know if he's actually a good guy or a bad guy. We don't know is he being redeemed at the end? You know, because Richard Gere is also too charming. We don't, even, we don't know if he's blasting. To be it's perfectly true. honest. It's true, yeah. <laughs> yep. Bill Duke mentions, he says, you know, a little tennis and orgasm or whatever. You're, you have this perfect life, but like, we don't know. Yeah. That's yep. a huge question that I have. And if we get, if we ever get to Dr. Schrader. You want to ask? Number one question. It, it, it's funny you bring that up. I don't know if this is like too soon to get into, but I I did feel, th there's like a 10 premature, second Premature, if you will. With, oh, yeah. Pre yeah I, I'm going to be a little premature here. Uh -huh. and, uh, it's fine. It happens to everybody. But he, there's a 10 second moment in this movie that I think is one of my favorite moments in any movie ever, only because I think it, there's a lot happening there that I think he's, it feels like Schrader sort of seeing his own future. It's when Laura, Lauren Hutton says to him, where do you get your pleasure? Mm. Right, and, right, And there's right. like a slow pull in on Gear's face and he like exhales when she says that. And I think this feels like the urtext for like what Schrader has done in his recent trilogy of movies that were like an unofficial trilogy where yep. like, I mean, they, they feel, all, this movie and those three movies, my, my grand theory, and I don't want to assume anything, it's just what I read into them, is that he's always struggling with his own bisexuality and his own pleasure and his own kinks. Like he's a very yeah. shame, he's full of shame. Yeah. And, right. And, and, and I think that question, where do you get your pleasure, is the central thesis of those three movies, among other things, I think. But I think like, you know, I, I said it in a little blurb that I wrote that like what I got immediately was like Father Toller and First Reformed is like pushing away the pleasure, trying to ignore it mm -hmm. until it becomes unbearable. And then William Tell in the card counter is sort of self flagellating He's like looking at where he derived his pleasure from and he's like, you know, beating himself up over it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and then yeah. I know you haven't seen Master Gardener yet, uh, Jake, but basically I feel like in that movie, Narvel uh, Roth, who is um, Joel Edgerton's character. Is sort of embracing where he got the pleasure from and coming out right. the other side is like a hopeful person and i don't know i i feel like this movie plants the seeds for that that he sort of took a the the scenic route to get to yeah uh, eventually yeah. but um but yeah i i think that's why it's so messy is i think he's a young man here and he's not fully reckoned with his own shame from where he finds his own pleasure i yeah. guess yeah yeah you found the quote. In it's, time. it's time. It's time. It's yeah. time. Brandon, you've, you've basically, I think, unknowingly set up one of the best quotes we've discovered from oh, Trader nice. so far. It's an incredible, <laughs> incredible yeah. find. I do want to say this is a dynamite theory. This is, this is incredible. This is, we're going we're gonna to have to be tracing the Brandon theory throughout the, oh, the yep. podcast. <laughs> I, and I, there's so many choices that almost happened that I think make the film 
Like, I think the the right choices were made. It would be maybe even more incoherent without these. But like, I think if Travolta is the movie is in the movie, especially now, it just reads as like hilarious because <laughs> yeah. his barely his just his very weird sexuality generally would make it laughable. I think Julie Christie is a wonderful actress, and and so is Jessica Lange. But there is something a little bit masculine about Lauren Hutton that makes it more interesting. And I think Lauren Hutton also bears, at least to me, an incredible resemblance to, I assume, Martine LaSalle, is how you say it? The, the lead uh-huh, actor in Pickpocket. Uh-huh. She looks yeah. just like this guy. That, yeah. Wow. They also wow. both look a lot like <laughs> one of our most beautiful friends, Joseph. Ian, I don't know if mm. you ever noticed that Joseph looks very much like he's in a, a the three of them. Absolutely. You're not wrong yeah. at all. Yeah. <laughs> a righteous a righteous chorus line. Yeah. And then Marauder's first choice for the to sing the theme music was Stevie Nicks, yes. who couldn't get out of a contract or something, which I think also locks it in the seventies way more than Debbie Harry. But Harry also has this kind of aggressive and confrontational sexuality that is while while certainly a, appealing to men like as much as as a stevie nicks does it it does have a kind of aberrant or or like a transgressive sort of quality her kind of punk sexuality but let's get to the (laughs) quote okay okay so so the the interviewer asks schrader are you supposed to find that julian's narcissism appealing something to participate in vicariously or are you meant to find it off-putting and schrader says well i certainly participated Let me explain this a little. If I chart out my life, I came to Hollywood as an overweight kid from the Midwest who always wore undershirts and too many clothes. Gradually, I succumbed to the physical culture of Los Angeles, which I think is one of the best things the place ever did for me. I lost a lot of weight, and I became interested in presenting the proper LA image. This is a business based on looks and style, and if you don't have either of those things, it's just an encumbrance in trying to sell yourself. If some schlump comes in, they're going to think it's a schlump movie. Whereas if someone walks in who's the hippest thing this week, they'll be impressed and think, well, he's on top of it. So that's one of the feelings that went into Gigolo. The other was to do with the fact that I came from a background in which physical contact was rare and in my family was exacerbated to the point at which my father actually shook when he held you. So when I came to L.A., I was very uncomfortable with that kind of kissy, holdy feeling. But then I started moving in gay circles and going to gay discos and I found a way into physical contact because it was harmless. I mean, I could go dancing stripped to the waist, hugging and holding men, and feel completely released and liberated because I knew nothing would come of it. I knew in the end I was not going to have a sexual contact. A lot of people have asked me why I have this strong concern for and even love for gays, and why my best friends over the last 10 years have been gay, and whether it means I'm really in the closet, but it's really because of that liberation. I couldn't get there through the heterosexual door, so I went through the other door and then came back round. Look, I actually think this is... This is nice. And I don't think we even have to say like he's definitely gay or definitely bisexual. But it to me, the reason I think you did such a great job, Brandon, is that you're saying that what it comes down to, so regardless of his sexuality, is the fact that this queer culture represented a route to like a healthy expression of physical pleasure, physical attachment, just the ability to even just like experience joy to some degree. And he f- he is both drawn to it and ashamed of it intensely. So I th- I think you're absolutely right. And and look, I I even get where he's coming from. I think as a person who grows up in any type of heteronormative atmosphere, queer culture can seem very liberating, regardless of yeah. your sexuality. Right to say like, well, yeah. Yeah. these are just people who have arrived at a place of comfort with their bodies, with their desires, with their relationships with other people. They're not necessarily afraid to hug their friends or or just like be cuddling with somebody regardless of their attraction to them. You know, th- that type of, of lack of, of concern for other people's views. Well, and I find it interesting too that he he's his whole thing is that, you know, I don't do any kink or gay stuff. And um, in the whole movie, he's out of remove. He has no feeling. He's a very cold person. Mm-hmm. He's at, has, has nobody close to him. And again, this maybe could be reading way too much into it, but when he thinks it's going to save his life, he finally says, you know, I'll, I'll even do gay and kink stuff. And like, it's, yeah. I find that interesting. Like, of course he's, you know, the, 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 the surface level of that is like, he's saying that to get out of the bind he's in, but I think that right. maybe there's something more there that he's, you know, he, like he's seeing a way out and I don't know, it's, it's all interesting. Yeah. I, I read that scene specifically as so much and, and his, 
apparent homophobia, which, and we'll, you know, our friend Robin Wood has some things to say on this. We'll get to Robin Wood corner in a second. But I think to me, those, the, the, his refusal to do, he uses the F slur. Ian, you were saying you were comfortable saying that on mic? No. Nope. You want to? Okay. <laughs> uh, he, he says, you know, he doesn't do that stuff. He doesn't do kink. And to me, that is part and parcel with his striving to move in these straight circles, these, these like high powered elite circles where like, you know, at least what's so fascinating is, is of course those circles include this kink and include, you know, we've, we've, there's a million examples of, uh, hidden queerness in among elites and often like, uh, fucked up ways, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, but because his is like a, high class of a high class surface he has to adhere to that surface where there's nothing kinky there's nothing gay and so to me his willingness then to like his his unwillingness to do those kinds of jobs is like part of the illusion that he's he's keeping up for himself included like he can't be the kind of guy who does those sorts of things because then he's low class then he is outside of that that inner sanctum or whatever but it is again like yeah it it does get to the question of like is he where does he get his pleasure like is he enjoying this to the point where like michelle at one point doesn't want to have sex with him because she thinks then he's going to work like she wants to sort of keep it above the pants so to speak because she she feels like when they're kissing that's him but when they're actually making love they are she's just seeing his sort of uh professional side and she lauren hutton's i think a tremendously underrated actor Very i think much she so, yeah. thinks she holds a lot of this movie together in a way that richard Gere can't and and she's also the first time i ever saw her was in a okay john carpenter tv movie yeah someone's stuff. watching so, me yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah she's great in that movie like she's the reason why i think i mean there's a lot of cool stuff carpenter's doing but um but it's you know very much a made for tv movie but um right but in this i think she's like why this movie doesn't completely fall apart and why you almost buy the the um the pickpocket ending. Yeah. I mean I would I would want her to come visit me in to prison. rescue you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To be like, polite. They they ha- they barely have chemistry together and it's mostly because of her that they have chemistry. It's yeah. like I think he's my favorite pickpocket ending of his is the card counter just because mm-hmm. I think Oscar Isaac and Tiffany Haddish have unbelievable chemistry yeah. together. But Yeah. I, to, as a brief tangent, I uh, heard some radio interview or something she did where she was promoting the card counter and she was talking about how Oscar Isaac smelled really good. Mm. Oh, I bet he does. Yeah. I yeah. believe that too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but yeah, that I just I just wanted to shout Lauren Hutton out because I don't think she, I mean, I don't know. I, it's weird to say, you know, oh, nobody talks about her because what does that even mean? I'm, somebody must be talking about her somewhere. But um, I think she's she deserves a lot more credit than I think she gets it, especially in this movie, because again, like I I think Richard Gere's striking. I think he's like a beautiful man in this movie and he's like eminently watchable. Like you get why he became a movie star yeah, off of course. Yes. But, but it's her who holds this movie together for sure. Yeah. And again, this to me this is another set of conflicting impulses, right? Because you have the character is named in part after Julian Sorrell from The Red and the Black, the Stan Hill novel, which is about a social climber who specifically uses sex and romance to uh, achieve the status that he thinks he deserves. So in that sense, similar to our our friend Julian Kay here. But on the other hand, we have the fact that it is romance in the form, the pickpocket form, which is going to rescue him from this situation. And then we, at least to my eyes, we just kind of the the status question just kind of disappears. It's not like he, well, or or does it? Because to connect it to the fashion as well, he he is unable to sort of accept this love until he is in prison clothes like until he is forced to wear this uniform that's mm. a great Granted, point he looks yeah. great yeah, he, looks, sure. he looks like a million sure. bucks yeah but he is you know he's he's stripped of his ability that's, to I, I like that argument yeah. dress himself a couple things about the you know i don't want to i don't i don't want to get into gay panic mode but paul says he was dancing stripped to the waist there's two directions from which you can get to the waist and mm, i am sure. i do wonder it'd be funny it's just funny to imagine yeah. him dancing with, doing with a, no pants with a shirt on and open, uh-huh. yes <laughs> with, uh, donald ducking as it were but there's also this this quotation from this is richard Gere talking to the advocate in 2012 i think mm-hmm. where he says 
Uh, Paul came to see me in Malibu and said, you've got to say yes to this by tomorrow at the latest. I read it and I thought, this is a character I don't know very well. I don't own a suit. He speaks languages. I don't speak any languages. <laughs> I like that, actually. I think it's very uh, yeah. charmingly old fashioned. <laughs> There's kind of a gay thing that's flirting through it. And I didn't know the gay community at all. I wanted to immerse myself in all of that. And I had literally two weeks. So I just dove in. Again, both of these guys, like, I just wish you could say, like, I hooked up with some guys to research the role or whatever you could say what you did and i feel like they're both they're both holding back so much i mean schrader later says he's talking about like grace and and christ's love in in specifically kind of in relation to the the pickpocket ending and uh -huh. the pickpocket ending of this film and he says it's the acceptance of unconditional goodness which is the same as spiritual grace you accept the idea that christ died for you and you did nothing to deserve this. I think it's interesting to compare Lauren Hutton's basically like sacrificing her social status as as equivalent in some way to getting crucified to death. Sure. He says, <laughs> you accept the idea that Christ died for you and you did nothing to deserve this. It's a gift and you just have to be open enough to accept it in order to become whole. When it's the case of someone offering their love, you just have to swallow your ego and accept the fact that someone loves you even though you don't deserve their love. I don't. Again, I'm not trying to be like 12 years old, but he is using, he, he talks about being open enough and okay. he's saying uh -huh. whole and he's saying yeah. swallow. Like, okay. I do think that there are things in his, I'm saying this is, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, uh, psychoanalyze yeah. Yeah. the terminology that Schrader is using here. And I think there is something, I mean, he's, his whole life is, is tangled up with the notion of this man who loves you so much, it will like save your, it, 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 it like has to pass in inside of you and like touch sure. some part of you that that is impossible to reach you know there is being calvinist is kind of gay i guess is what i'm <laughs> what i'm getting at here and i'm uh-huh uh, come on there's something to this i mean i think well, there is a there is a great, there is a, great there, being here thank guys. you brandon uh, yes yeah. I, I, i'm gonna say the same thing it's also been great being here good luck uh there is an ero look there's an eroticism to depictions of christ's love like throughout yeah. I don't, dis yeah, I don't disagree, saying, like a St. Sebastian or something, but I don't, look, yes, you can also Mishima, say that. Mishima is big into St. Sebastian. He too, sure is. So it, it's yeah. connected. Okay. But <laughs> I, I guess what I'm saying is that it feels like there's there's more in the text itself to address that doesn't require us to sort of say like, you know, fellows, is it gay to be Christian or whatever? So, yes, it is. <laughs> I guess well, that's what, cool. I, what I'm but, saying is, but but what I'm saying is that's cool. That's like fine. That's actually good. Sure, sure. But to me, it's still maybe an oversimplification here. And, and yeah, I think sure. what's maybe more important is that if we compare it to these other texts, right, where somebody is receiving this type of grace, right, like a crime and punishment. If you're familiar, Raskolnikov kills somebody, blah blah blah. A bunch of stuff happens. Develops relationship with a a poor sex worker who's also like unbridled charity and kindness inspires him to be a better person and he turns himself in and you know in kind of a pickpocket way she is his road to redemption and then in the conformist we have a queer coded or seemingly gay man who is choosing to live heteronormatively for fascist reasons basically to like achieve this normal life that's approved of in fascist circles and he does it all for social acceptance and for the ability to feel like he is part of a collective and specifically the collective that has power in society. And then when fascism falls, he flips and does the opposite of the thing. But in that film, he betrays the woman that is kind of like trying to offer him this grace. And I think both of those routes feel very interesting to me. What I think you guys were saying correctly is what frustrates me here is that if there's hints about like what queerness would offer to him, I feel like they're kind of like abortive hints that don't lead anywhere at the end of the film because it ultimately does get the pickpocket ending which suggests that he needs just a sort of classic manifestation of of love right of romantic uh, hetero romantic love and in that case i don't know if it totally works because the man himself said that that his sex scenes are trying to be like godardian or brissonian and yeah. and cold and unerotic and i think that's fine but it's weird that that the film can't make up its mind about like what what is this central romance is it one that sort of like defies our desire to want them to fall in love and defies our desire to want them to to have sort of like a classic romance film type type development because often it does feel that way often it's totally weird and i don't understand like what their connection is they don't seem to have a lot of chemistry yeah she she chases him down which is sort of off-putting to him 
And I think rightly so. I mean, it is strange. It 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 does seem strange for her to pursue him so much and she like breaks his rules she she comes to him to his place he says you know women don't come here Mm -hmm. she asks you know how much it's all she's she's like uh she's not keeping up the appearances i suppose yeah i also think schrader kind of fails in even making these sex scenes feel clinical and i don't know if that's just a byproduct of lauren hutton and Richard Gere being so beautiful, but like yeah. these do feel very leering. Yeah, and, I and, totally agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I don't think he accomplished what he was setting out to do there at all. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we do. We should talk briefly about Richard's gear. It is <laughs> historic. Mm, uh, yeah. According to something I was reading, it said that this is probably the first time in a like a Hollywood movie that a male actor did full frontal nudity. It's from a distance, like many things in the film, and it's uh, sort of semi-obscured by the uh, horizontal blinds so many horizontal blinds in this film uh, yeah. creating a kind of i don't i don't really know what to make of this there's a lot of that in the conformist it doesn't do the obvious kind of you look like you're in jail thing quite because it's horizontal but it's a skewed jail perhaps i don't know this is me yeah. making making stuff up <laughs> sure yeah i mean i think brendan you're right where there's so many things where again i don't know if it's it's gear not quite transmitting what we're supposed to be getting if it's schrader's script choices his editing choices because the the sex scenes to me are neither fully erotic nor fully cold and i feel like it's right it's actually not that hard to make a cold sex scene because i feel like it takes more work i mean you, i guess you, yeah. there's a lot of existing grammar for making an erotic sex scene but i feel like if you just shoot you know like the action itself out of context is already kind of cold and and alienating so yeah i mean i feel like we get that in hardcore like yeah. shooting the 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 on the porn set like exactly on neurotic to me exactly. the wallpaper's totally falling down yep. yeah yep so yeah and and returning to to what you're talking about brandon with this like yuppie image which again i'm i'm not sure how it fits with all these other pieces which is why maybe it feels like we're talking about these these disparate things i think that's kind of how the movie feels but yeah, we get this sense early on where he goes to talk to Nina von Palant from uh, I just know her from The Long Goodbye mostly, um, where she also she, lives yeah. in a beautiful uh, oceanfront Peach, house, Peachside Manor. Yeah, yeah, but she is his madam pimp. I don't know exactly like yeah. where she gets him. She's, she's the a, Jane Adams to his Thomas Jane. Uh huh. Exactly. <laughs> Remember that yeah. show? Remember how there was an HBO show for like years? All about how this guy is a big dick. Yep. Yeah. 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 Exactly yeah. right. It's yeah. Insane. But they're engaged in this like private market exchange where he is trying to, I mean, I guess a la hardcore, but in hardcore, we're getting sort of the proletariat exploited version. And this feels to me like he's in this new world, like everybody's a businessman for themselves, right? right? Uh, uh, market yeah. logic applies to your personal life somehow. And right. he's arguing for for like a, a bigger cut and sort of negotiating Trump style uh, with her. And again, I don't, I don't know how that leads us exactly to this. I think it's interesting to just say like, how is this blooming in in people's personal lives, this understanding of themselves, not just as like, laborers but somehow is like labor and product and right. boss rolled into one all the time I, I, well again it's it's very much in conversation with like early michael mann with like Thief yeah and, yes, and it feels, yes 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 it yeah. feels like where schrader can't land on a salient kind of view of it man is like violently you know like pro-labor yes. pro-laborer yeah, that's, uh-huh. that movie yeah. is incredible yeah. yeah yeah and but but there's there's a lot of of like thief in the scenes with with nina van palant uh, is sort of, you know, he's a man with a code and he he does yeah. his job his way kind of a thing, which is mm-hmm. very, very Michael Mann. It's I'm like, not a fan of, I'm not a fan of playing that game of like, you know, would someone have done this better? But I mean, it does feel like Mann might have made a better movie out of this, like a more cogent movie, I think. It's possible. I mean, it would have, it's... It might have been derivative of Thief, though. Thief of... Play. <laughs> thief of Thief, yeah. Uh-huh. Thief of Passion. I think maybe this is a good place to talk about the Armani of it all a little bit. Yeah, Shout out yeah. to a friend of the show, Carly from Hit Factory, who came through with uh, <laughs> the Armani research Ooh, portion of yeah. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I did some... So so Armani, Giorgio Armani, there's two Giorgios. First mm, of all, incredible, incredibly high number of Giorgios on this production. Giorgio Armani is a an Italian designer, grew up, you know, it, through the 
fascist period and and after the war and and all of that his his big contribution for anyone who's not up on the history of menswear his like sort of innovation was the unstructured suit mm. the the thing that distinguishes these suits from he he was sort of in opposition to the kind of Savile Row tailoring which is you know the the lined and like uh the the uh, padded shoulders look of James Bond or whatever uh of or imagine you know like mid century like mad men kind of thing or early mad men let's say the early seasons of mad men specifically Armani this is from an article by Ada Peerview in in Classic Journal Armani stated that his notions of deconstruction were even political in as much as he was advocating a change to the status quo, replacing the confining traditionally tailored Savile Row suit. Giorgio Armani introduced a notion of fluidity and ease of movement that reshaped the design of formal menswear. He achieved this more relaxed silhouette by knocking the stuffing out, removing the padding, and dispensing with the lining. And Armani himself said in 1995, uh, quote, I have found myself in the position of a revolutionary, a revolutionary who has always defended the right to be normal as an extreme mooring of sophistication, a point of arrival in which the details above all are important, thus operating by subtraction, by removal, using ordinary elements. I have, they say, turned around the very concept of elegance. My revolution has not always been evident to all, perhaps because it was not as dramatic as most revolutions imagine themselves to be. But over time, it has proven to be much more incisive. Now, this is from Emporio Armani magazine. So this is, we uh -huh. can kind of chalk this up to like ad copy, essentially. Yeah. It's a lot of, yeah. of words with uh, associations that would be helpful for selling uh, a certain type of lifestyle rather than him Actually, saying he's a real revolutionary. Right. But it, you know, it, it is interesting that the character wants to fit into these, wants to move in these elite circles, but he is dressing like the next thing you know he's it's it's a, a relaxed look a fluid look i mean we could even maybe connect it to an androgynous uh -huh. type sure. of look in yeah, a way yeah. there's also you know as opposed to the like the the stark dark suit light shirt kind of look of of the other men in the film it's a lot of tone on tone or like uh -huh. um beige and grayish and i mean he looks great obviously i want all these clothes <laughs> but I do wonder to what extent we can consider like fashion to be that transgressive in as far as it's part of this consumerist well, motive. Like it's it, it's not like, you know, these new suits are liberating anyone. They're just giving like Mark Zuckerberg is still a robber bear and he's just uh -huh. wearing yeah. a, a hoodie or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think tracing back like dandyism or specifically not just fashion but we'll say fashion that tries to capture like a high aesthetic or extremely demonstrative type of of expensive fashion uh i think in itself seems to trace this sinusoidal wave of being reactionary and then progressive and then reactionary and then progressive or sometimes overlapping because i think the first dandies were like in the thermidorian reaction like bourgeois aspirants who wanted to be like aristocrats basically and we're saying like if i dress like an aristocrat i could be an aristocrat in the same american gigolo style like the surface will create what lies underneath somehow right i will achieve right. this this imagined ascendancy but then you do also get moments of dandyism that i think are like queer culture right obviously tied up in in dandyism a lot it's going back to like your oscar wilds or something where mm. you you get this opportunity for performance that is both allowing you to blend and also like break down some of these questions of of class or gender norm or like what's acceptable or what's correct or what's impressive and and then also i think there is this belief that somehow in your choice of of surfaces you are reflecting what is happening underneath i think that people who uh, or some of the people who appreciate fashion the most believe not just that it's like an aesthetic choice but it's an aesthetic choice that demonstrates something about the individual beyond just conformity. Because obviously, I think lots of us have been in conditions where you dress because the other kids at your middle school are wearing these sweatshirts. So you get one of those sweatshirts too or something. Yeah, it took me a long time to be brave <laughs> enough to wear white sneakers, like all white sneakers. Because I don't know if this was true of either of you, but like when I was in elementary school, all white sneakers meant you were gay. That was explicitly Interesting. how it was we stated. We did not have this, huh? And now, of course, white sneakers are very, very hip. And also, yeah, I yeah, don't yeah. care if they're gay. 
it's also interesting like if i i think i have this right i might be confusing it with another fashion movement but i think a part of dandyism is like changing your outfit many times throughout the day Mm -hmm. right and yep and that's that's what he does here and it kind of it's an interesting thing to like you know you're trying to blend in with the aristocrats but you're still you know you still view yourself as out of remove from them but it's like at what point are you part of the elite when you're spending so much on these outfits to change throughout the day it's like there is a good i think there is a nice contrast there of blurring the lines of like how much is he the laborer and how much is he actually just part of this social structure now he's relatable in a sense but also he's you know he's sort of becoming a part of this class that he you know at what point are you just part of that class with them right yeah. well, well i th- i think the the scene in the auction house is exemplary of this because he is he is working as a he's like a paid a literal escort like a companion mm. but he is pretending like the facade is that he is a different kind of paid companion one who is and this is the, you know don't care for the voice don't care for this this bit that he does <laughs> where sure. he I guess, well, you know, Gear only had two weeks, so I guess this is the best he could come up <laughs> yeah. with. Uh, but no, he's he's pretending to be like a gay German interior decorator. But this yes. is another sort of, this This is a, uh, a very narrow channel through which like queerness is... is uh, Acceptable somehow. Ex- well, it's it's contracted it's uh-huh. like uh ex- almost it's like extracted from essentially like these these uh these people have better aesthetic sense we'll we'll pay them to use it and then make them leave and once we have like a, a couch that matches the table or whatever right it's not it's not shameful because you're taking advantage of them so that's ultimately like a right. power move for you exactly yeah. and uh, there's a there's a great article from paste uh, by kyle turner from from 2018 called a room of one's own paul schrader's queered masculinity in which he, he explores some of these ideas and talks about it says uh american gigolo is a queer film by virtue of its form schrader imbues the film with queer aesthetics it's california neon painted fakeness it's kitschy set design and it's little dose of blondie um and it sort of it sort of identifies like the, all of these this uh, a facility with like visual codes as something inherently queer, which I mean, it kind of still is it's still seen that way. There's still like a, a there's a resistance by straight men to even like dare to try to know how to dress themselves in a lot of <laughs> in a lot of cases because like just giving a shit is coded as gay. Exactly. Uh, still yeah. somehow. Yeah, and I we we haven't gotten to it yet. I don't. No one has. I've I've never heard anyone talk about the film The Walker, the two thousand seven Schrader film The Walker. Have you seen this? Brandon? I haven't, but I I remember when it came out. Yeah, because it's kind of an update of this character. It's Woody yeah. Harrelson plays, I think, an explicitly gay esc- literal escort mm-hmm. who yeah. who is like a paid date for older women as opposed to a professional. Um, orgasm donor yeah. yeah yeah but i'm excited to kind of re-explore this when we when we get to the walker also incredible the just the very idea of woody harrelson playing a gay man is really uh <laughs> it's true yeah just <laughs> tantalizing yeah but to your earlier point jake i think that's nice and again i'm going to use queering now in sort of the uh, extremely academic sense that it's used uh, by academics i admire but it's sort of distinct from just like normal life version of this word but the idea of, which I think is also a, a Scarfio, the idea of looking at spaces and using them how you want them to be used, not necessarily like how they have traditionally been used somehow, right? So I think in The Conformist, people make a lot of how he would shoot these these like monumental halls or shoot uh, like a cemetery for an insane asylum or sort of like use use things to create whatever effect he wanted to create, regardless of what... The traditional association was or or just shooting mm-hmm. them for like function somehow and i think uh we do get some of that here where we're, we're like the the houses are shot in a very strange way like the exteriors in palm springs i think are sort of like yeah brutalistic and imposing and and his madam's house is shot from these like strange angles that emphasize the structure more than like the fact that right. it is a house yeah. which i think is very weird and there's these there's women sunbathing topless which we've we've discussed this from from the uh easy riders raging bulls they 
what's his name? Biskind? Is that who wrote it? Uh-huh. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, yeah Biskind. Peter Biskind, uh, Biskind yeah. Uh, Peter, your friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter Biskind describes um, the house where Jennifer Salt and Margot Kidder lives mm. on the beach as and, and like all these new Hollywood guys hung out. She describes it as basically constantly peopled with topless sunbathing women who the men had to kind of try to pretend they weren't going cartoon wolf mode about. And, and uh-huh. I think it's telling that like Julian is just unimpressed and they like want him to stay and hang out. And yeah. he is, yep. he resists this either because he's so in control of himself. I think it's, it's fascinating that Schrader is always, he, he often describes himself as like just able to do things, like able to will himself to do whatever he needs to. He mentions, you know, I lost weight and uh-huh. uh, I, yeah. I term, I, you know, I became hot. And I yeah. learned how to dress. And like, uh, there's, there's never a struggle. He's, he's so in control, as he describes it. And I think a lot of these Schradarian protagonists have the same, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's a benefit of repression that you're able to, uh, yeah, you get a lot of discipline out of it. Or maybe Julian is not. Yeah, like an illusion of discipline, maybe. Yes, maybe yeah. Julian is not attracted to these women. Maybe he, I mean, it seems almost, the way he describes sex is kind of, it's like a, task that he is it's a a challenge he finds enriching but uh-huh. i wonder even if he's like asexual if he if if we could read him that way because he seems to do it for some other like he gets he gets a kind of fulfillment out of it that i think is not the typical well i like that you i like that you brought up the the architecture in this movie because i feel like unlike the sex scenes he does achieve a level of like there, there is almost a clinical mm, yep. feel to it because right. It is luxury, and as much as Julian wants to fit in, none of the houses feel aspirational to me. None of them are no. shot in a way that makes right. you want to live right. there. It's it doesn't feel like luxury at all. It feels, I don't know, and it's it's interesting to me that when he when he gets to the prison, the the way the sound drops out and you can kind of hear the wind blowing around, even though he's in an inside of a prison, it feels like even like the the rooms that he's sitting in, like when he's being interrogated, they feel more open than, yeah. you know, like yeah. it's just, it, it's a very interesting way to kind of shoot that. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that's wholly what he was going for, but it does feel like when he's finally, you know, and when he's in prison, he's finally out of this life. And it's like, that's when things start to open up a little bit and thing, you know, the wind can move around and everything, but um, feels a little more open to me than, you know, these these rich mansions that he's going in and out of. Or or literally the opening in a convertible wind blowing in his hair right. that somehow right. we then ar- right. arrive at an understanding that he is unhappy. He's trapped in right. that somehow. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It's I, and I think speaking to the architecture as well, like the the violation, like the the most of the violence that is visited upon him is like the the tossing of his apartment or like when yeah. his his car like it's it's a it's devastating to him when he has to take apart the car to try to find if there's like been evidence planted on him or anything it's, right like yeah. that scene that scene is more brutal it is shot like a murder scene more so than when he kills uh uh bill duke mm-hmm. like, right the, the, right you, you don't see the body you don't see like the blood splatter yeah. on the ground but it does feel like like you know when he's taking that car apart it feels like he's dissecting like a person it's, right it's yeah kind yeah. of upsetting and so brutal like, it is yeah even yeah. the the conversation style tear down of his apartment i think feels the same way even, right. despite yeah. the fact that we know that these things don't make him happy so i guess in some ways we should feel like this is uh like liberating uh, exactly yeah. but it doesn't yeah. feel that way it feels like he's yeah. being forced to tear down this monuments that he constructed to himself or yeah. for himself uh, despite his best wishes yeah we haven't even talked about Hector Elizondo, his like pickpocket talk about inspector. Hector Elizondo, I do have a clip. Hmm. Uh, but Hector Elizondo, I think he's playing Detective Joe Sunday, which feels, you know, obviously Sunday, Sunday, somewhat significant day for Christians. Uh, <laughs> that but also, I'm going to give to you. All right. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, recalls uh, Dragnet in a, in a way, like there's mm-hmm. something kind of metafictional about that in a way or, or, or calling attention to itself elizondo of course also in pretty woman with richard Gere, where he plays the john and weirdly i feel like Wait, he's he plays a john i thought he played no he play, Gere plays the john oh 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 yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, I was yeah. Gonna, hector elizondo plays like the the mater d like the hotel guy he's who extremely charming he he's plays so like charming. the the, yeah. the yeah he's like the kind of the master of the <laughs> beverly wilshire who mm. who secretly helps julia roberts essentially turn herself into julian k like she, yeah th- th- yep the process of 
making herself like fit in with the the elite and then weirdly he plays basically that same character from pretty woman in the princess diaries movies yes. oh yeah, yeah that's right yeah, yeah. <laughs> but elizondo i think is terrific i love to see him me too whenever i see him and it's fun seeing him this young too i, yeah. I didn't know i yeah. didn't know he wasn't like born 63 years old <laughs> exactly. so that's true uh, yeah. right and he kind of still looks like this whereas i feel like he and Billy Crystal were kind of neck and neck as a, a type for a little while. Yeah. Uh, but then Billy Crystal turned into whatever he He's like is. like a wax figure now. now. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. looks like like Martha Washington or something. I don't know what's going on with that guy. <laughs> there was like a there was like a five year period where Billy Crystal could be called like hot. Like yeah. yeah I mean like Harry Metzali. Exactly. This yeah. is a classic Twitter post where people are like, wait, was Billy Crystal hot? And uh-huh. then. Like the, yeah, the, my my favorite version of that is Running Scared. He's like so hot in that movie, the the Peter Hymes right, buddy right, cop right, 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 mm-hmm. the yeah. buddy cop. Yeah, yeah, he's it's crazy. <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. What's well, like, or uh, have you ever seen a movie where Joe Piscopo takes his shirt off? Oh, it's nuts. Yeah, he's, yeah, he was like a bodybuilder. He like got yeah. into bodybuilding. <laughs> okay, uh, like in um, what's that movie called? Dead Heat, the one yeah, where yeah, with the he has like the zombie partner. Yeah, or, it's yeah. actually kind of awesome treat williams is like a like a cop who dies and comes back to life and like continues being a cop wow (laughs) it's cool but uh yeah we have this scene that's basically straight out of pickpocket that in the barber shop uh which i have a clip for and i will say uh transcendental style heads up i trimmed a lot of the transcendental dead air from Mm. this uh so that the clip is not 20 minutes long (laughs) so this is julian talking to uh detective sunday doesn't it ever bother you julian what what you do giving pleasure to women i'm supposed to feel guilty about that but it's not legal legal is not always right men make laws sometimes they're wrong they're stupid or jealous and you know better some people are above the law well how do these people know who they are they know they ask themselves so i mean i love pickpocket Great movie. Yeah. The fuck did this come from? Yeah. Like, we, we get no indication <laughs> exactly. that Julian has like any ideology. Yes. Or even yeah. that he cares that it's against the law what he does. Like, it doesn't seem like he believes that his job should be legal. It's just he's like something he does for money, you know? Yeah. This yeah. feels totally unearned. And again, I mean, first of all, anybody else, if he really sounds like Oscar Isaac in that clip, I got to say. So did, it makes yeah. sense. Uh, that, he did, yeah. Um, but sure. This is also a direct pull from Crime and Punishment. And the thing that Crime and Punishment and Pickpocket also have in common is that arguably they are doing things that we don't approve of. I feel like even at this right. time, Schrader is aware that it's not like morally objectionable to help older ladies achieve orgasm. So it's weird. I mean, the right. whole point of those characters is like they are putting forward this idea that you can violate not just law, but like the laws of man, right? The sort of like uh, social taboos about what's acceptable if you are one of these superior men who sees beyond and not only do we get right. none of that with richard gear he's doing something that on paper seems nice so it's a very weird exchange right right and it and it that 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 did i kind of that hit my ear a little weird during the movie too because i was kind of picking up on the fact that throughout the movie there's never a clear point being made not that there needs to be but there's never it never feels like the movie has any opinion on whether he's breaking the law or not doing mm-hmm. this Yep. And, right, I, and I think right. that that's kind of progressive in a weird way. Like, yeah. it's it's nice to have a movie that where it's like sex work is work and everything. Yeah. But but so for that to come out of nowhere, it just it's it is it's it's a little it's kind of the movie summed up into one clip. It's like you feel like you're riding a certain wavelength and then out of nowhere, the movie will hit you with something. And it's like, well, what, or, do you mean that now? Like, what's going on? And then yeah, that it never, sounds like yeah. he did it. That sounds like yeah. he killed the lady. And also yeah. that sounds like what he's doing is good and actually like maybe is is a challenge or it's it's right. bad and and he's seeking something else but is the stuff that he's engaged in making him happy right you said that Schrader planned this film based on the idea that like he's unable to express love but now it's part of some ideological project that he's engaged in i don't know yeah i i mean i i think there's something i wonder what robin wood would would say to this beyond <laughs> stop stop right now <laughs> Turn it off, turn it off in, in uh, George C. Scott voice. But um, he compares it to cruising. He was talking about how it was uh, uh, American Gigolo was, he says, uh, homophobia is central to American Gigolo. It was playing with, without protest in the same Toronto theater complex where gay activists were picketing cruising. I find it incomparably the more offensive of the two films. 
and would argue that its social effect is, is probably far more harmful being covert and insidious, in addition to the fact of the film's trendy commercial success. The entire progress of the protagonist, Julian, is posited on the simple identification of gayness with degradation. Julian, the gigolo of the title, is accorded the status of existential hero because he takes pride in bringing frustrated middle-aged women to orgasm for suitable monetary compensation. He is trying to forget a past where he used to trick with F-slurs and is threatened with having to return to it, coerced by a black homosexual pimp and criminal. As Julian is not supposed to get pleasure from his sexual experiences with older women, but likes to give them pleasure, as well as get paid, the implication is presumably that F-slurs don't even deserve pleasure. The film traces Julian's progress towards salvation in the form of a heterosexual relationship viewed with true fascist sentimentality and direct plagiarism from Basson as uplifting and redemptive. The fact that the ultimate Schrader villain is both black and homosexual can scarcely be regarded in the general context of his work as coincidental, which is, you know, there's some some fair points he makes there. Uh, and I think a lot of what the reading that we are, have been doing is is sort of in the incoherence of the text. Although, to be fair to Robin Wood, that excerpt was from his essay, The Incoherent Text. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and even Schrader himself, I think, apologized. He said of, of his films as one that he now maybe recognizes some of the injustice in his portrayals. Yeah. Well, it's 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 interesting too how like for the most part you know other than that Kyle Turner piece which I think I've read that too um I think is pretty great there there hasn't been a huge from what I've seen a huge queer reclamation of this movie as there has has been with cruising right where it's like cruising was was like seen as so offensive when it was when it released and now I feel like that way more than American Gigolo like I think queer audiences have really found that movie to be like have embraced that movie a lot more and it's not yeah it's well it's so prescient also of like it's it's eerily prescient of aids like it functions very well as an aids metaphor well in this this movie feels embarrassed at a lot of points of homosexuality like we talked a lot about that but i think julian is and i wonder Mm -hmm. you know it's yeah it's it's right and cruising never feels that way to me Mm. even though like a lot of i i never feel like if you look at the two club scenes next to each other, Julian feels wound and tight and everything. And, you know, when he's walking down the steps, he, you know, he feels so alien in that setting. Whereas when Pacino's in the club scene, that's when he finally lets loose. And like, that's right. Like the he dances like image. Schrader. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Cruising is a great movie. I it love is. that movie. Yeah. I, I wonder, I would love to see Schrader in like, I'm thinking of, of, uh, after sun or like, the ending of a film we talked about on our Patreon. By the way, we have patreon.com slash uh, podcast. Uh, the end of Valeska Greasebox Western. Mm, yeah. um, there's just sort of a dance sequence. Um, I would love to see specifically Paul Schrader, like just letting it, letting it loose on the to, dance floor. Uh, uh, beat for beat remake the Denis Levant dance from yes, the end of Boch Boch yes. Travai. <laughs> Same outfit and everything, yeah. tight or just black like, shirt. Yeah. Do you remember when people were like recreating the Robin dancing on my own video? Oh, Let's yeah. get Schrader to do a little. <laughs> oh, get him, wonderful. get him in some kind of anthology film, and that's that's what he does. <laughs> Ian, you were going to say something? Oh no, I was going to say yeah. That to to Brandon's point, weirdly, I feel like the way that the club scene in in American Gigolo is shot is the way it's shot is alienating because it's like this semi-empty club that he goes to at a point of desperation that we talked about, right? He's seeking out this alibi to save himself from the the dreaded Bill Duke character. But what I think is odd is that the one character that he encounters in there, who is a shirtless man who's dancing, seems like a nice guy. So even the film itself is kind of like belying its own homophobia, where this guy just like is helpful to Julian Kay and lets him go and that's it. That's their whole exchange. And he seems to just be enjoying himself dancing on his own, which is nice and (laughs) straighterian. But yeah, it's uh, even that within that single instance, you know, I, I'm not sure what we're supposed to pull away from this. Is this is this place a threat to his life or a threat to order? Or is this a place of camaraderie where it's like these sex workers and these outsiders support each other and form a community? I don't know. And I, I think the films that I've seen that depict that kind of found family tend to come from queer filmmakers female filmmakers sometimes you know people from more marginalized groups than the one that paul schrader comes from Uh, (laughs) his group is marginalized only because they are uh, like uh, so christian that it Uh freaks people out (laughs) yeah (laughs) but yeah i mean it's a a strange strange movie 
I'm thinking about it a lot. I mean, I yeah. I don't want yeah, to say that I, I hate it. It's no, uh, it's no. it's fun and interesting and and frustrating. I think uh, Brandon maybe used that word. I think that's a good word yeah. for it. I I really dug it a lot. Like I, I'm I think on the whole, I think it it has to be successful. If I've been thinking a lot about it, um, it's right. successful at something. Mm-hmm. And I think like like I, I compared it to his recent trilogy of movies, and I think that it was instructive for me to finally see this because those three movies have been in my head more than most movies the last 10 years. Yeah. And, mm. and I think seeing this really opened those up in a deeper way for me than most of his earlier work has. Like I love hardcore, but I don't, I don't feel these, those three movies in hardcore as much as I do this one um, or blue collar or something like that. So this was, I'm glad I finally got to see this. Yeah. It's, I mean, I'm I'm gonna pick up the 4K when it comes out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Part of that is yeah. just because I'm like I'm a I guess I'm a little I'm a piggy for uh, video discs rather than uh-huh. for little knit ties with the end cut off. Ian, you oh, like one, you like those a lot. That's I do. Your yeah. Kind Unfortunately, of I, I really found myself in that famous Jay Gatsby narcissist scene that everybody knows from this because he had yeah. a lot of ties that I would have also worn in college. The ties are nice. I'm definitely. Yeah. I'm definitely on the uh, the disc side of that. I'm, yeah. I'm, it's been kind of killing me lately because there's been a, a lot of the labels are having sales again and I'm trying to save right. for a, mo- a move so I'm yeah. not letting myself buy anything. And I'm mm. just like, man. Well, and they keep announcing 4Ks of Schrader. It's like it's like Schrader season. Though. Yeah, He's trying, getting... to, trying to get them all in before he uh, goes, I guess. <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Not a, yeah, yeah knocking he's on wood here. But... Trouble, yeah. Yeah. But, it's crazy. Uh, I mean, if if your if your last uh, subject can keep, you know, he's uh, he's looking like a skeleton, decade. and he's he's got he's ten still more going. movies yeah. in him. Oh, oh yeah, Jared I mean, number he's twelve. He's probably shot two by the, by the time <laughs> we finish true. this conversation. Yeah. Like, yeah, Jane Goodall starring in one. Wow, man, like a like a <laughs> nonagenarian love Ape story film. with Jane Goodall. Oh yeah, I mean, I did wonder were they talking about <laughs> Manus? Like, is did he it, did he connect with Jane Goodall initially because he did? the ring she called movies. it every which way you can or whatever she <laughs> called it yeah. yeah yeah i don't know we'll never know do we have any final thoughts on on american gigolo before we close up shop think, here uh my my last thought is that uh, uh on the marauder part of it all mm, uh, yeah it, it, this is completely unrelated to anything he just has a song on uh daft punk's album random access memories yep. where the first time I heard it, I thought it was Arnold Schwarzenegger speaking because they sound exactly <laughs> alike, and I it, it was very funny. Yeah, so that's my final thought on American. I have to check that. Yeah. I did not know well, he's going to be back for Cat People. He's involved in the in the soundtrack of Cat People as well. It's yeah. so he's... Giorgio will return. <laughs> I did want to mention the guy who who edited this film. Where did he go? The guy who edited this film, his name is Richard Halsey. He edited Rocky mm. and Harry and Tonto. All kinds of stuff down and out in Beverly Hills. Joe Bush is a volcano. Uh, Edward Scissorhands. So I married an axe murderer. Like all kinds of movies. But he also edited Big Stan, the directorial debut of Rob Schneider. Oh, wow. wow. And bring it all back to the himself. Uh-huh. The, the European gigolo himself. We're going to have to lock yeah. Brandon in for a Patreon <laughs> episode on the Deuce Bigelow uh, uh, duology. Mm, you want to punish him, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very excited. I have seen saw both in theaters as a kid. So I, just, wow. I, I just watched Deuce yeah. Bigelow for the first time. It is a very cruel film. Uh-huh. In which, I don't think I knew what a gigolo was when sure. I saw the first one as a kid. I just remember seeing it. I saw a lot of Rob Schneider movies in theaters as a kid, not... Now that I think about it. I've, mm. I saw all the Adam Sandler movies that he's in, but I don't think I saw any of his. I, I knew I even the then. Animal, I saw the hot chick. Hot yeah, chick. I, I don't know why. I can't stand Rob Schneider. I don't know what what was going on with me. <laughs> Interesting. Did you huh? see Big Stan? No, I didn't. He's in it's... prison in that one. Also, it's oh, the, the final film role of Henry Gibson. Frequent, uh, wow. Yeah, who stars <laughs> in The Long Goodbye with Nina Van Pallant and all. Of welcome to Mooseport style. Connects. Yeah. Yeah. Noble. Yes. <laughs> and we'll all meet in that big moose port in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got one more thing to do here on the show, which is our sexual obsession check in. Ah, yes. Brandon, I don't know if you saw this when it happened. Schrader was introducing a screening of one of his films in New York and had this to say about his next project. I've never written a, a script about sexual obsession. And uh, so that's the one I'm doing now. And uh, on this show, we are going through and trying to determine if he has ever written a film that was not about sexual obsession. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so far, yep. I mean, I think we determined Blue Collar is not really... Hardcore 
I think we all came to the consensus that it might actually not be about sexual obsession in a way. Or indirectly somehow. Indirectly. Yeah. Yeah. Is this film, do we think this film is about sexual obsession? I would say no. I think it's, obviously it's dealing in sex and everything, but I think he, like we've talked about, I think he's so removed, Julian's so removed from like the actual pleasure of sex mm -hmm. that I would say... There's real, no real obsession with sex in this movie. It's there's obsession with image, mm. with you know, uh, labor, everything like that. But I think sex is like the furthest thing from this movie's mind. I'm inclined I to, tend agree. to agree with you. Yeah, yeah. and I think yeah. even even when I I believe the film is maybe putting him forward as this like sort of modern feminist sexual dynamo, right? Who's like thinking about female orgasms. It's in this controlling way that it was intensely unsexy to me right again sort of like orgasm as this this achievement this this right. like uh the little thing he says to the the woman uh, miss uh, the 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 Reinman mm -hmm. woman who ends up getting murdered his his little speech to her about how he's going to take care of everything like icked me out a little yep. bit yeah, me too. Yeah. It's yeah. it's like yeah, it's it's uh, he's looking at it from the perspective of like someone who loves his work and did a good job at work today, right? Like a it, KPI, it, it, right? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, like we're unanimous nose here. Surprise, it's somewhat surprising. Yeah, right? yes, unanimous nose. All right, Ian. By the way, just for this quick Westwood update, did a little Westwood research because you and I went to UCLA. Yes, this is a weird document a of yep. Westwood forty Westwood. carats. Yes. Uh, the Tower Records that he goes into, uh -huh. now uh, the Urban Outfitters, uh, uh, Me and Me Pita, mm -hmm. where he has the like coffee meal or coffee uh, uh, date with uh, Hector Elizondo, I believe is the now shuttered Tomodachi Sushi Restaurant. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Uh-huh. And his apartment was uh, not in Westwood. So Great. that All is right. uh, Westwood Corner. Anyone is currently listening to this from Westwood, California, you can shoot us an email, podcastyforme at gmail.com with the subject line, boring email. Uh, that's about going to do it for us. Thank you again, Brandon, so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank I'm you sorry so much for having about me. most of the things yeah. I, I said on the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me. This was a wake up call to uh, not be so effusive about every movie I watch. Oh, so, no, uh, please don't, no, don't change don't your behavior in any way. Don't let shame you, my man. <laughs> don't listen to me. Turn the headphones off. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're working on, where folks can can find your stuff, anything cool you got in the hopper? What am I working on? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter just under my name. Uh, however you see my name spelled here, just type that in without the vowels and that's how you'll find me. Um, but uh, what, what am I working on? I have a, uh, a Zack Snyder interview that just dropped that I thought was pretty fun. And yeah, next I'm going to have an interview in a few weeks with uh, the three main stuntmen from The Fall Guy, which was a lot of fun. Mm, um, sweet. And with the, the lead stuntman of that, I'm, he, I'm really excited because he... This interview was like a day before this happened, which I'm a little frustrated by because I would have loved to have been, talked to him about it. But he was just announced as he's get, he's being credited as the first ever, I want to say, stunt designer on a film, which I think is... Whoa. It was unanimously agreed on by like SAG-AFTRA and someone else. I'm not remembering the name right now. But I think the, the distinction there is to hopefully move forward with an, a stunt Oscar eventually. And I think a stunt designer would be similar to a set designer or something like that to where that's who will be given the, the credit on a potential award. So cool. that's exciting. He's the, the I, I think it's kind of stupid that they needed to do all that work just yeah. for a stunt Oscar, but right. it's also exciting. So yeah, that's a long way of saying I have an interview with him coming and I'm excited about it. Sweet. We'll keep an yeah. eye out for it. Excited to read that. Yeah. And uh, Ian, you're, I think probably going to get uh Get the one of those Oscars, all these freaking stunts you're trying to be pulling on the show. <laughs> uh -huh. No selling my good stuff that I work really hard on. And then you're like, I don't care. Yeah. I completely forgot to tell you about. I'm going to a Mexican wedding. I And I haven't told you about this at all. So wow. we have to talk about this. We're doing a special Beautiful. Jake's going to a Mexican wedding all episode. Right. Great. The Boda, Boda prep episode. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, a um, little teaser for no one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening to the show. Remember to subscribe, rate us, write a review. It helps us on the algorithm. If you like the show, tell a friend, tell your dad, tell a uh, woman several decades older than you to whom you are delivering immense pleasure. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Podcasty for me. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, or you're interested in co-hosting a two-person Paul Schrader podcast, you can email us at podcastyforme at gmail.com. We're also podcastyforme.com where you can find all this stuff if you weren't paying attention. Thank you to Jeremy Allison for our artwork. 
Thank you to Jeremy Fragrance for all that he does. That guy is like a <laughs> real fascist. I take it back. I don't actually feel that way. And uh, join us next week where we're talking, you know, one of these Paul Schrader films that uh, falls through the cracks a little bit. Something called Ragging Bull. I don't mm, know what that means. Yeah. Uh, so be we'll be first. Talking... Never heard of it. Yep. Never heard of it. And this has been the episode on American Gigolo. Was it good the second time? Yeah, it was. was, It was was great. It was really good. This highlight of my life. Thank Mm -hmm. you so much. See you next time. Bye. Bye.